Hello, and welcome to this session of Equip and Connect 2024. This session is Historian Training 101. This is for local church historians, others who may be thinking about becoming a church historian, or really just anyone who's interested in learning more about the record-keeping and history of your own local church. I'm Russ Ford, a member of the Western North Carolina Conference Commission on Archives and History. Joining me in this session will be Sandria Williamson, chairperson of the commission, Nancy Watkins, a member of the commission who recently retired as director of the Southeastern Jurisdiction Heritage Center at Lake Junaluska, and the Reverend Jim Pyatt, our conference archivist. This session will consist of six video segments related to the training of a church historian. After each segment, we'll pause for comments, questions, or maybe you just want to share some personal experience related to the topic under discussion. Now, here to lead us off, here's Sandria. Hello, I'm Sandria Williamson. We're here at Bass Chapel United Methodist Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. This is an old faith community that's been serving the northern end of Guilford County since 1875. This is the first in a series of sessions on the job of a local church historian. So, now you are a church historian. What exactly does that job entail? Let's look at the Book of Discipline, paragraph 247, subsection 5. It says, the responsibilities of the historian are to keep historical records up to date, serve as chairperson of the Committee on Records and History, if any, and cooperate with the Annual Conference Commission on Archives and History. It continues, the historian should provide an annual report to the charge conference and to provide for the preservation of church records and historical materials no longer in use. Why keep these records? There are at least three really good reasons. For legal and other reasons, church leaders may need to document some past event or decision. It helps the church remember and celebrate their history. Understanding the past helps the congregation plan for the future. Some important steps you'll want to remember are organize a committee on records and history, establish an archives if one does not already exist, Encourage church officers to keep accurate church records. If your church already has a written history, keep it updated. If the church does not already have a written history, start one. Promote interest in the history of your congregation and the United Methodist Church. Help in planning the church's historic observances, especially milestone anniversaries such as the 50th and 100th. Help people who wish to do research in your church's records. Here are some other tips that can help you in your work. Learn more about your community history and how your church relates to it. Talk with others in your community who are active in historical organizations. Review the historical materials already assembled in your church to determine what needs to be updated and whether they might be better organized. Talk with long-term members of your congregation to learn what they can share about the church's history. If feasible, record their oral histories. Participate in workshops and training offered by your conference and district leaders. In the future, other sessions will discuss types of historical materials to save, where to find them, and things not to save organizing and preserving historic materials, working with church leaders in preserving historic records, resources available from the conference archives, and researching and writing your church history. Thank you so much there, Sandria. And we're ready now for some questions or comments if any of our participants would, would like to chime in at this point. Uh, does anybody have a question? Well, while we're waiting for people to think of a question, let me ask you one, Sandria. What exactly is the Commission on Archives and History? The Commission on Archives and History is a body that's set up at various levels, all the way from the general conference of the church to the jurisdictions of the church and down to our 
various annual conferences. We're the group of people who are charged with the duty of, of finding, recording and preserving the history of the church and also of making it available to people who are interested in it. I think that just about everybody who's on this call is probably in that category. You're interested in history and you're interested in preserving it. And the commissions on archives and history in every conference, at, in every jurisdiction and all the way up to the general church level is charged with that duty. You might even wanna know, well, what is it that we do? Well, we look for and preserve as much of the history of the conference that we're in as possible. And we try to provide resources for people who are interested in studying our church histories. Our, we keep up with the conference archives, that is repository where churches which have disaffiliated or churches that are closed for any reason send their records for preservation. We keep the records of all the annual conferences that are held. We keep just about anything you can think of. Suppose somebody wants to know a little bit about their own church's past. They're writing their church history and they're not sure where they can find information about all the member ministers who serve that church. Guess what? They can call our conference archives. So who takes, who oversees the conference archives? That's the commission on archives and history. I'm probably gonna stop talking about the archives right now because Jim Pyatt, who is the conference archivist for the Western North Carolina Conference is also on this call. Is that helpful, Russ? Oh yes, I think so. Let's see now, does anyone have a question you'd like to uh, ask at this point? Well, hearing none, I, I can say that uh, we will be covering all of these points, the ones you just covered in that previous video uh, in much more detail with some of the uh, videos that we're about to do. Uh, let me at this point also acknowledge our producer, uh, Dave Clausen of DLC Solutions, who the gentleman you see there waving his hand, who is uh, responsible for a lot of the technical details that we're doing tonight. And we certainly appreciate what you're doing for us there, Dave. And so now, I guess, since we have no questions on this immediate topic, we'll just move on to the next video, which is Setting Up an Archives Part 1 with uh, Nancy Watkins. In this section, we'll talk about the hows and whys of setting up a local church archives, a record retention schedule, with a focus on what should be kept in your archive, and how do you decide what should be kept permanently, and what should be discarded if it's no longer useful. The first step in setting up your archives and beginning work on a retention schedule is to obtain the support of your church administrative body. This project is much more successful if the congregation's leadership understands how important it is to your church. And next, you need to find the records. Let the congregation know that you're beginning this search. Find out what groups create records in your church Search out the records. They may be in the attic, the basement, the janitor's closet, the office, stairwells, and people's homes. Make a list of what you find and where you find it, and ask for help if you discover that any materials are missing. Next, you need to talk with your office staff or your church staff and committee chairs and find out what records they create and how they use them and how long they need to have them accessible in the office. Now you're ready to create a record retention schedule, which sounds daunting. It answers the questions though, of what do we keep? How long do we keep it? And what happens to it when it's no longer serving an administrative purpose? You have help with this. The General Commission on Archives and History for the United Methodist Church has created a set of guidelines for local church historians. You can find these guidelines on their website at gcah.org. Once you get to the website, look for guidelines and publications under the resources tab. Let's take a look at the sample local church records schedule that you'll find in the guidelines from the General Commission on Archives and History. This is the chart form and you'll see that it has a record series title, 
a description of what belongs under that record series, the total number of years that it should be kept, the current use, and this should be interpreted as the number of years, the length of time that the records should be kept in the church office, and then whether or not these records should go to the church archives. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. You see here the record series title, Administrative Reports, and in this group you would include charge conference reports, administrative council reports, and other administrative reports. They should be kept permanently in the archives, and the General Commission on Archives and History recommends that they should be kept in the church office for two years before being moved to the archives. Down here, you'll see bank statements. You'll see that the Archives and History recommends that these are kept for seven years, three years, in the office, but they do not go to the archives. When you've created a record retention schedule for your church tailored to your needs, you need to seek legal advice where necessary to make sure that the time limitations that you've placed on the retention of your records are legal um, according to your county or state laws. You can seek legal advice usually within your church or in the county courthouse if you have questions. Now you have created your record retention schedule. You've had it reviewed to be sure that it fits legal guidelines. Now it's time to have the administrative body of your church approve this and follow that schedule. In addition to helping your office staff and making sure that you have the appropriate materials in your archives, this record retention schedule is actually a legal document. If a church is ever faced with legal action, having a records management program in place is one way to assure courts and litigants that records are being cared for and disposed of properly and in a routine manner, not maliciously or in a capricious way. This concludes the session on records management for the local church. There's more to come. Uh, thank you so much for that part, Nancy. And Nancy will come back with a part two in just a moment. Do, do we have any questions or comments about it at this point? Russ, I need to make a comment to lead off. Um, I went to the General Commission on Archives and History website today because I couldn't find my copy of the of the retention schedules and I've discovered that they have a lovely new website which is a huge improvement over the previous one but at the present time the record retention schedule for the local church is not available on the website so I will be investigating that with the staff up there tomorrow and um, hopefully that will be available in the meantime, I, I, I can ask question, answer most questions without. Uh, on, on that particular topic, I guess I should mention it is available on the Western North Carolina Conference website. Uh, if you Good. go in uh, wnccumc.org slash archives and uh, down scroll down on the page and there is uh, the retention schedule is there one of the things you could uh, link or click on. Good. I had forgotten and about we, that. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> I realized as we were watching the video, the address that we had on the slide there is not the, the not the current address anyway. But later on in this uh, session here, we will have the correct address on the screen. Uh, also, any questions? Also, yeah, if ahead, anyone Jim. needs a copy of those retention guidelines, call me or email me in the conference archives and I will be glad to email you a copy because I scanned what used to be on the GCAH website. I have a question myself, uh, Nancy. Could you just give us some specific examples of when a church might actually need a record from five or ten years ago? Well, I think Sandria mentioned several of those reasons in, in her segment. Um, most frequently, I would say that they're needed uh, when a church is preparing to celebrate a milestone, uh, an anniversary of some sort. 
and they need to do some research. You're, you're told um, you need to keep all your church bulletins and newsletters, and those are a great source of information about the history of your church. And then, of course, there are the administrative questions that come up. You know, when did we make that decision? Um, why did we make that particular decision? So um, those are, are really um, important reasons to make sure that you hold on to these things. I've noticed a funny thing in our church over the years, uh, not so much recently, but in the past, the uh, church council would adopt some policy or make a decision, and maybe they would put it in the minutes, but then it's totally forgotten and nobody even remembers it being done. That's and yet right. it is official church policy. <laughs> yes, yes. Could you mention some uh, reasons that some records are not kept in the archives? Well, one reason that comes to mind is uh, a lack of space. Um, you see, um, <laughs> I've often said that the difference between a historian is, and an archivist is that historians like to keep everything and archivists like to think that they know how to make a decision about what to keep and what not to keep um, because there, there are those space issues. And then too, um, once you have this retention schedule and you've, um, you're following the, let me see here, um, about personnel issues in particular, you, you just don't need to have um, those around. Um, those are, I would consider somewhat confidential information. And once their retention period is met, then they don't need to be to continue to be available. Jim, you probably have some things to add here from your viewpoint as a conference archivist with this sort of question. A couple of things that I would mention are, I remember when I was serving a church 20 years ago and we needed to rewire the entire sanctuary. The electrical contractor showed up, asked, did we have the working drawings of the sanctuary? I grabbed the blueprints, the working drawings of the sanctuary. We spread them out in the sanctuary and he said, thank you. You just saved me a week's worth of work. Also, I remember when K Bishop Carter was an associate pastor at Christ in Greensboro, the air conditioning went out in the middle of summer in their chapel. And there was a wedding rehearsal scheduled there that night. And I can remember, I can't remember whether it was Ken or one of the other clergy on staff got the blueprints to that chapel, which was a relatively new part of the campus at Christ at that point, and had them ready for the HVAC repairman when he showed up to fix the AC. I saw a comment from one of our participants um, pertaining to church membership, and I even as the archivist for the SEJ have some experience with people who um, come up with a life situation where they're required to show proof of their church membership. And those membership records are permanent and any person should be able to go back to their home church, any church they've been a member of through the years and provide documentation that shows that they were a member there. And that can make a big difference um, with, uh, I had a woman contact me a couple of years ago who was getting married in Italy, and she was not going to be able to get married if she couldn't find proof of her church membership. And we were able to find that. So can be critical and on a personal level, very personal level. Oh, absolutely. As archivist, about twice a year, I receive a research request for somebody's church membership documentation or for somebody's baptismal information or somebody's wedding information from a closed or abandoned or merged church. And it comes in very handy to have those records to be able to answer those questions. If there are no further questions at this point, uh, Nancy, you've done a really good job on the uh, second part that we're about to hear. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and hear that. Hello, I'm Nancy Watkins, and this is part two of our presentation on setting up a local church archives. Now you're ready to select a location for your church archives. 
you need to consider climate control, security, and accessibility. Archives should not be kept in the church office and your church staff should not be made responsible for their care and maintenance. Consistent temperature and humidity levels are very important. While the ideal is 45% relative humidity and 65 degrees, very few churches can provide this type of consistent environmental control. So look for a place where there is as little variance as possible. Try to avoid attics and basements where there tend to be wide variations in temperature and humidity levels. The records should be made available for research, but only under supervision. Your next step is to gather the records. Use the retention schedule to determine which records should be in the archives. Create an inventory list of what will be in your archives. Now you're ready to organize your records. Assemble all the records of a particular group. Keep your administrative council in one group. Keep your United Methodist Women's records in another group, and so forth. Sort each group's records by record type. Divide them into the minutes and reports or any other memorabilia that they might have, especially for United Methodist Women and your youth groups. Arrange your documents alphabetically or chronologically as appropriate. Now you're ready to consider how to house your records. If your budget allows, purchase acid neutral folders and boxes. This is not always possible because of budget constraints. If your budget does not allow the purchase of acid neutral folders and boxes, record storage boxes and good quality file folders can be found at your local office supply store. Place like materials together in folders. For example, Folder 1, Administrative Council Minutes for 2000. Folder 2, Administrative Council Members for 2001. Label your folders with pencil. Place the folders in the boxes and label the boxes. Now create a finding aid or inventory for each group of records. Now let's talk about caring for your records. Here are some key points to remember. Do not do anything that cannot be reversed. No ink, no glue, no lamination. Remove all rubber bands and metal fasteners and use plastic clips where needed. Photocopy newspaper clippings onto acid neutral paper. A good quality photo paper is adequate for this purpose. Store photographs and negatives separately from printed materials. Cover windows to reduce the amount of sunlight. Cover fluorescent lights with UV filtering sleeves if you're in a space where the lights will be on for long periods of time. Store boxes on open steel shelving rather than wood if possible. Do not rely on computers or magnetic media such as CDs for storage of archival records. Follow your record retention schedule. Remember, it is a legal document. Review the record retention schedule yearly and make any needed changes. Whenever possible, print electronic documents that belong in the archives. For those that cannot be printed, it is essential that all records, especially backups, are migrated when operating systems or software are upgraded. Organize your computer files just as you would your paper files, and remember to make backups. This concludes our session on setting up a church archives. And here we are again, and this again is an opportunity if anyone would like to comment or uh, ask a question or even just uh, surrender some personal experience you've had. And hearing none, we'll move on to the next one, which is working with church leaders in preserving church records and being a church historian. Uh, our speaker now is uh, the Reverend Charles Curtis, who has formerly served several churches in the Western North Carolina Conference. So uh, let's hear what Charles has to say. Why does history matter? Why do we keep all these records and this stuff that takes up a lot of space in our church and takes a lot of manpower to maintain. There are important reasons why we do that. First is, there are times we will need records of past events and decisions that were made in our church. 
The knowledge of the past helps us better understand the present and plan for the future. And it is useful as we celebrate our heritage of where God and our lives in the church meet. Paragraph 243 of the Book of Discipline lists the basic responsibilities of the local church, including providing for the proper creation, maintenance, and disposition of all record material of the local church. Current records, such as minutes of meetings, financial, membership records, are created and maintained by church leaders or staff and are generally kept in the church office or some other location. As church historian, you are responsible for dealing with church records only after they are no longer in current use. In other words, only when they are transferred from the active files into the church historic archives. The General Conference Commission on Archives and History has published a detailed booklet on the retention and disposition of different types of church records, including a chart on what to keep as a current record, how long to keep it, and whether it needs to be saved in the archives when no longer in use. You can find a copy of this schedule at the address now on your screen. Another good source of information is our Book of Discipline. There are numerous references to creating and preserving church records with respect to historical matter. That person is normally the church historian. One area that the pastor can make a major contribution is as chair of the nomination co uh, committee. In this role, he can make sure a qualified person is put in that position. One major influence the pastor can have after nominating a good historian is motivating the church to keep good historic records. The pastor should work with the trustees, the church council, and the finance team to ensure there's proper space and funding for church archives. It should be noted that the historian's vital work is the safeguarding of artifacts of historic value, such as photographs, artwork, old collection plates, communion sets, pyramids, flags, pennants, sometimes antique office equipment. Some churches have permanent displays of these artifacts. The pastor should be very supportive of this activity. The pastor should cooperate with and promote the use of the church archives and support the celebration of historically important occasions within the church. The historian should be involved in planning the historic celebrations. Looking back to see where God and the body of Christ working in union, our congregations, and our denomination together, which inspires us to seek the presence of God, the story of our faithfulness, our history of God and us together is worth preserving. To learn more about the Commission on Archives and History, visit the Western North Carolina Conference website at the address on your screen. Okay, thanks a lot, Charles, and uh, any comments at this point from anyone? Well, and we'll just move right on along then into uh, one of my favorite uh, parts, and this is where uh, Jim, uh, the Reverend Jim Pyatt, tells us about the conference archives. Why don't we see that one? In 2018, the Western North Carolina Conference Archives relocated from the conference office building in Charlotte to the campus of Pfeiffer University in Meisenheimer, North Carolina, about 40 miles northeast of Charlotte. The archives are located in the G.A. Pfeiffer Library on the Pfeiffer campus. Hello, I am Jim Pyatt. I am the archivist for the Western North Carolina Conference. Our assistant archivist is Sonia Clow, and we are privileged to have her on staff working with us in terms of doing research for those wanting information on local churches 
and people in the Western North Carolina Conference. The Archives is the repository of documents related to closed churches, active congregations, clergy of the conference, conference boards and agencies. We have files of all of the, the churches in our conference. Um, this is just one of them, but inside you might find a bulletin from a homecoming celebration, you might find a list of pastors, or even uh, newspaper clippings of a vacation Bible school. The contents vary wildly from one church to another, depending upon the materials that have been submitted by the local church and by others. We have deeds for virtually every church in the conference, and we have other documentation as well. For example, I have pulled the records for our Wesley Chapel United Methodist Church, which is located about a mile from the library where we are at this recording. This is the file we have from Wesley Chapel. Among the materials we have from Wesley Chapel are newspaper clippings and pictures related to a fire that destroyed the sanctuary on February 19th, 1967 construction documents, letters, and other documents related to the construction of the current sanctuary at Wesley Chapel, articles related to the dedication of the parsonage, charge conference records, and various other records related to that congregation and its history. Another resource that we have here in the archives that is helpful for local church historians are the Western North Carolina Conference Journals. Each year, the Western North Carolina Conference publishes a journal of the annual conference. In here is a complete list of the appointments for the coming year, a complete list of all the clergy, their addresses and telephone numbers, the reports from all the boards and agencies in the conference, the minutes of the annual conference session, and statistics on every church in the annual conference. Many of these items can come in very handy for local churches in terms of doing research on your church's history. For example, you can look at the appointment list and see who your pastor was in a particular year. You can also look at the statistics and see what the membership was at a particular time in history, how many joined the church that year, how many died that year, the average attendance at worship service. And also you can see how much money was given for missions or other projects. Also very helpful is each year there is a section in the journal of memoirs of clergy who have died. You can look up former pastors who have gone on to the church triumphant and read about their career in ministry, read where all they have served and some of the things they did in ministry at your church and at other congregations. A journal that is especially helpful for many churches is the 1939 Conference Journal, the Western North Carolina Conference. You see in 1939, the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, and the Methodist Protestant Church all merged to form the Methodist Church. Sometimes a church is not sure which denomination they were part of prior to the 1939 merger, and knowing which denomination you are part of helps immensely in finding who your pastor was and any other relevant records pre-1939. In the 1939 journal, beginning on page 81, is a list of church school superintendents. In that list of church school superintendents, there are markings indicating which churches are part of the former Methodist Episcopal Church, which ones are part of the former Methodist Episcopal Church South, and which ones are part of the former Methodist Protestant Church. This is a quick and easy way to determine which branch of Methodism your church came from. Another resource that we have in the Western North Carolina Conference Archives are files on every clergy who have served in the Western North Carolina Conference. In those files, we have a copy of their service record, in most cases, we have several pictures. We also have their memoir from the conference journal if they are deceased. And occasionally we have other documentation related to their ministry and career of service. These can be very helpful as you look up former clergy. 
and try to tell something of the story of the people who have served as pastor of your congregation. We also have a number of quarterly conference minute books from the 19th and early 20th century. While we do not by any means have all the ones, we do have enough that we can check and see if we have something related to your congregation. These quarterly conference minute books help to tell both when churches were organized, tell something about the life and ministry of the clergy and laity that were in positions of leadership in those circuits at that particular time, and also can help to date when churches came into existence. An example of how these quarterly conference minute books come in play happened when I was asked to do some research on a local pastor who served in Haywood County in the second half of the 19th century. The only records we have from the conference journals is that he was ordained a local deacon in 1862. Yet I could go to the quarterly conference minutes, see where he was regularly in attendance, where he even served as secretary of the quarterly conference on multiple occasions, could tell that he was out of Shady Grove Church in Haywood County, and could tell other things about him, his life, and ministry. As you research your local church's history, Sonia and I will be more than glad to assist you with your research. You can contact us through either the email addresses or the phone number that is listed on this screen, and we will be glad to provide answers to your questions. You are welcome to also to set up an appointment to come and research with us. We suggest that if you come and research, you contact us in advance to make an appointment. We're normally here on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Also, it helps for us to know in advance so that we can check and see what we have that might be of relevance or of help to you as you research your local church's history. Jim, I have a couple of questions. One is uh, you were talking about Wesley Chapel Church. What are some of the other uh, really interesting inquiries you might have had over the years? There was one church that is a successor church or came out of several of the earliest churches in Forsyth County that contacted me recently saying, Jim, can you check in the files of th those churches that were the earliest? And can you check in the files of churches that we were on a circuit with to see if there's anything there that could help us in celebrating our anniversaries or in celebrating our church's history? And I was glad to do so, and I found actually a bulletin of that particular congregation that was misfiled and found a few other items that would be of relevance to that particular church as they celebrate their history. Another recent request was not so much local church as it was genealogical that was interesting. This person was looking for two clergy out of western Cleveland, eastern Rutherford County that are part of his extended family tree that served in the latter part of the 19th century, one of whom served very briefly, one of whom served for about 40 years. And I was able to provide him with an ample amount of information, particularly about the one that served for a number of years. He also wanted pictures, and I said, didn't have any of the one that only served for a couple of years, but I had set, could find several that had served for the one that had served a number of years. And one of those was a group picture from around the turn of the century that identified somebody else that he was interested in and related to. It turns out he was, when he saw the name Plato Durham, he got all excited. But it turns out the one he was more interested in was Plato Durham Sr., who was not clergy, but Plato Durham Jr., his Plato Durham Sr.'s son, was a clergy member of the Western North Carolina Conference and also the first dean of Candler School of Theology. And I was able to provide him with that connection and that sort of information. The research requests that come in range from, can you provide us with information regarding our church's history? Can you provide us with pictures of all our former clergy? Or can you provide us with a list of who our former clergy are? It ranges very wildly, and in some cases, we're able to provide some wonderfully detailed information. 
Other cases, we just simply don't have very much. And I never know until I start looking. But it's always an exciting hunt for me. Jim, I wonder if uh, people if want to contact you, is it better if they uh, contact, you, contact you by email, by phone, or maybe just coming to the archives? If you just simply come to the archives, you're running a risk that I'm not there, which is part of the reason why I strongly suggest you either call or email in advance, because normally I'm there full time on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I'm only part time in the archives. And because of that, it pays to check in advance. Also, there are times I am out of town doing other things. There have been several times this fall I was picking up records from a closed or abandoned churches. So I needed to be gone that day to get those records because it was the day that the person who was in charge of helping me get that done was available. But I strongly urge you check in advance phone calls or emails. Either way, it doesn't matter to me. I just don't want your trip to be for naught. This is the final session in our series on training for church historians. This session is on writing your church history. Behind me, you see the chancel area of the sanctuary in Hawthorne Lane United Methodist Church in Charlotte. Several years ago, I was privileged to work with a committee of church members in writing the history of this church, celebrating its 100th anniversary. Today, we're going to talk a bit about you writing your church history. To begin, what do you want to include in it? Of course, you'll want to have the origins of your church, who were the founders? What was their vision in starting the church? Important dates, your first church building and maybe later buildings. You'll want to list former pastors, maybe with some biographical information about each one. Sunday school classes, the choirs, United Methodist women and Methodist men, youth groups, scouting if your church sponsors scout troops, missions, fundraising, and fellowship activities. In their history, First Church of Lincolnton did something interesting, a whole chapter of interviews with older members recalling earlier days in the church. Now you must wonder, where am I going to get all this information? Well, let's go up to the Heritage Room. This is the Heritage Room, where the church displays its historical artifacts, with exhibits on things like scouting, Sunday school classes, and these photos of former pastors. This is also where we find some of the church's oldest records. When we were doing the history book on this church, this is where we found a lot of our material. As a church historian, you probably already know where the records are kept in your church. As a start, find out if someone in the past has already written a history of your church. Most likely it'll be out of date, but it'll give you a good start and possibly stimulate some ideas on details you'd like to add. What should you look for? Well, church council minutes, newsletters, old worship service bulletins, church directories, Sunday school class histories, if any, and records kept by the United Methodist women, Methodist men, and youth groups. Beyond the church's own files, check out the conference archives. You'll find a wealth of material there, including annual conference journals and even a file on your own church. They have some excellent books about Methodism in North Carolina that may even have information about your church and its former pastors. Your county register of deeds office will have records of real estate transactions involving your church. If your church was started by another older church, Check with that church for any historical records they may have about the origins of your church. Old newspaper articles are especially a good source. Many libraries have archives of local newspapers. Searchable databases of newspapers on the internet can be a gold mine. Some charge a fee, but a short subscription could be worth the expense. Obituaries of deceased members can provide good background information on them. 
As you begin to gather material, it's helpful to set up file folders by chapters to keep it all organized. Start writing as soon as you begin to collect material. Remember, nothing is chiseled in stone. You can always go back and rearrange paragraphs. Try to balance your content. It's easy to focus on the first couple of years of your church, then jump ahead to modern times, but surely many things happened between those times. Think about events in the community or nation that might have impacted your congregation. Things like national affairs, natural disasters, pandemics, growth in your community, and new technology. How did these things affect your church or its members? Try to use names. People love to see their names in print, but avoid long lists of names. If you want to include a list, set it apart in a box so it won't slow down the flow of your narrative. As you write, keep in mind who's likely to see your finished work, including visitors, prospective members, others who might have an interest in your church. Write so even a non-member will know what you're telling about. Be careful with placeholders in text, such as insert date here. It's embarrassing when one of those dates doesn't get inserted and the words insert here shows up in your published version. You'll want to follow accepted rules for punctuation, spelling, and capitalizing. The Western North Carolina Conference has an excellent two-page guide with standards specific to the United Methodist Church. Check the conference website for a copy. Used correctly, photographs can be a valuable part in telling your story. Except for a special section, such as photos of all former pastors, every photo should relate to something in the text and should be placed as close as possible to that related text. A good photo shows people in action, pouring tea at a luncheon, hammering nails on a mission project, speaking in front of a group. Always include a caption. It can be just a name under a portrait or a complete sentence explaining what the photo is all about but establish a style for each of these two types and be consistent. A common feature in church history is, is a photo gallery of former pastors. If you're having trouble finding photos, first try the conference archives. Check surviving family members of deceased pastors. Your local newspaper might have photos on file, and another place to search is other churches your pastors might have served. And finally, just a word about copyrights. As with any kind of writing or publishing, you need to be aware of copyright laws. These apply to your use of any material created by other people. Excerpts from books, newspaper articles, photographs, music, even drawings and artwork. And except for a very few situations involving live worship in your sanctuary, churches are not exempt. An excellent guide has been compiled by the United Methodist General Council on Finance and Administration. You can find it on the internet at the address shown on your screen. And that, in brief, should get you started in writing your church history. If you do the job well, your work could be a valuable research resource in your church for years to come. It can be fun and rewarding. So uh, this is one last chance now for anyone who uh, wishes to make a comment or ask a question about anything that you've seen here tonight. Yeah, yes, I'm hoping you can hear me. I do have a question. Uh, I'm Alan Fritz, I'm from Davidson County, and um, our church is rather old, and I'm really uh, interested in our church history and can certainly date it back to 1837. Um, the interesting thing that I'm finding out is, and I, I think that Jim Pyatt, it uh, looks like I'll probably be visiting him in the conference archives. Um, we do have a, a cemetery, uh, a, a burial in our cemetery that's some 26 years earlier than our first recorded deed. It goes back to 1811. And then some tax documents referencing in 1778. So I don't know. I don't know if I should be hung up on, hey, why is why is this person buried in our cemetery in 1811, 
when we don't have a deed until 1837. So uh, it's it's enough to drive me crazy, to be honest with you. And uh, it's enough to really make me pursue what's happened around that time and then even further back to 1778. So I, I'm just wondering if there's some credence in pursuing that or if this was maybe a family a family um, home or family church. I, I'm, I'm just at a loss. You raise some excellent questions, Alan. Which, first of all, which church are you from in Davidson County? Uh, I attend Ebenezer United Methodist. We're just about two miles north of of, of Lexington. Okay. Uh, not that I'm that familiar with it. I know where Ebenezer is. It could be that the church is older than has always been presumed, and because the church would not have property unless it existed first in the 19th century. Or it could be that the family that was originally a family cemetery and it was deeded to the church once the church was organized. But it is something that is, it could be any one of several things. And I, Sandra, and could is, you add to that? Yeah, this is Sandria. It's very interesting. I've noticed that here in Gilbert County, many of the churches that are documented as having property in the late 19th century actually uh, had what they had, what they called brush arbor churches. Before there was a building, they, they were meeting either in somebody's home or under in, a, in an outdoor space that they called a brush arbor. So it's quite possible that person was a member of a congregation that did not yet have a building. And it's really interesting to research. If you can find the family name and perhaps look in, those, in the records of that family to find out if there's more information about it. And again, you could also check with the materials for co annual conference records that could indicate whether or not there was a meeting in that place, even though they didn't yet have a building. Is that helpful, Alan? Uh, yes, it, it really is. I keep I keep thinking there's got to be some poor circuit rider come riding through our community who documented this and, and visited this family. Uh, the crazy thing, is, and it seems like I'm, I'm looking for the uh, the golden goose, so to speak, and uh, and but our 1837 deed was not recorded until 1847, which I, that's a little hard to understand. Other than maybe that was when our conference succeeded from Virginia, or in that ballpark, or, or was created from Virginia. And at that point, I think maybe our conference in North Carolina said, you know, get your deeds in order. And maybe that corresponded with why we went back to 1837. But I, I do think there was a, a brush arbor of some sort. Um, I do have the family member. It's a, it's a family called Hyatt, H-I-A-T-T. -T. That was a local family. And that's the first, the first infant that was the first person born there. So it's really got me baffled. And I'm not, I'm new to this and I'm, I'm certainly not educated enough to even know where to start. So I think that's why um, if we've got a, a, a conference uh, at, at Pfeiffer, which is not too far from us, it, it probably is going to you know, warrant me a visit. That's an interest. You've got an interesting situation there and you never know what you're going to find until you start looking and digging. That's always what I have found and what I believe. It sounds like you've business. done a lot of good research there, Alan. Yeah, it's it's you know it it's really it's just just baffling. Uh, and mm -hmm. and then I ran across where you know our 1837 deed was at one time used by another Methodist church as one of their deeds, and that threw me even more and. Uh, so it's just absolutely crazy that the McCrary family was huge in this area. And I, I, I know that it, it, it's got to be tied in some, some way to the McCrary family or the Heitman family. So there's a couple prominent people in this community at that time. It's just a, a needle in a haystack. And I need guidance as to like, OK, start here, look here, go there. You know, uh, it's, 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 it's quite fun, believe it or not. It's definitely fun, but there are times you hunt and you may find exactly what you need that's the answer. And then other times it may take some time to find it. I'm remembering quite well when 
a neighboring pastor of mine was doing research on a church in Guilford County and beating his head against the wall trying to find something. And then all of a sudden, they made a couple of connections that made everything tie together. Best thing I know to do is to keep looking and keep asking. I wanted to just quickly say, too, that I had some recent contact with Jim Pyatt. I've been working for several years, um, scanning pictures, doing the church history, trying to put it all together. We have 41 ministers. I got 37 of them. I've been knocking myself out, sent an email to Jim Pyatt, and the next day I got all four of the pictures. So it was wonderful. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome, John. It was a privilege to help you in that way. It's also amazing that we had access to all four pictures because fun, our access of pictures of clergy who served at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century is limited. It's providential that at Epworth Concord, you happen, all four of those happen to be pictured in one or two of the and sources that I've got. I think you said it was all in a book uh, from 1903. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. But glad to help. That's one of the resources that we have and one of the things glad to do. Well, Sandria, I wonder if you have any uh, closing thoughts as we approach the end of this program. Yes. And just before we do, I was curious. I am curious as to whether or not any of our other participants are interested in working on their local church history as a writing project. Well, I encourage you to do so. It's not always an easy thing to do, but you, as Jim and Alan and John have already said, it is fun. And I encourage you to do so. Well, since you guys haven't got any more questions and we wanna thank you for attending this session. Your Western North Carolina Commission on Archives and History is always ready to help. You know, when you join the church, the church has asked each of us to do several things. And one of the things they've asked us to do is to pray. Another thing they ask us to do is to support the church with our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And think about it. All of us can serve because all of us love Christ and he called us to do that. One of the ways you can serve is not necessarily sending us money to our guys, but if you have unique or even um, not necessarily unique, but unique to your place, documents and pictures that you may find that you don't really want to keep in your church anymore. We don't have all the space in the world, but we do have space in the archives for some of these things. And what you have may feel like um, an overload for you, but be, may be a resource for someone else. So if you're willing, send it to Jim, let him be the decider as to what we will keep and what we will not. As Nancy said earlier, we historians want to keep everything, but archivists will know how to sort through it and make it useful and discard those things that are not necessary. For all of you, we want you to know that the Western North Carolina Commission on Archives and History, excuse me, is ready and willing to serve and to have you witness along with us to the history of the people we call Methodists and to tell the story of Jesus Christ and the church that serves his purpose. I'd like to thank you for being here tonight and turn it back to us. This concludes our workshop for church historians. Many of the resources mentioned here tonight may be found in the conference archives and are available online at wnccumc.org slash archives. Scroll down and you'll find a link to the document retention guide Nancy discussed. Just below that is a link to the style guide for church publications. The copyright article published by the General Commission on Finance and Administration can be found at the website now on your screen. If that's too long to copy, or if you have any other questions, just send an email to this address, historiantraining at gmail.com. The conference office also plans to have video recordings of all workshop sessions available online. Check the conference website for more information on that. Thank you again to my co-hosts, Sandria Williamson, Nancy Watkins, and Jim Pyatt, for helping make this session possible. And thank you for taking part in this with us. We hope it's been helpful to your work as a church historian. Have a good evening.